O God, who by the passion of Christ, your Son, our Lord, abolished the death inherited from ancient sin by every succeeding generation, grant that just as being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature the image of the man of earth. So by the sanctification of grace, we may bear the image of the man of heaven. Through Christ our Lord, amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man, so shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. tus manos encomiendo mi espíritu Father into your hands I commend my spirit Padre a tus manos encomiendo
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene, he said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. 
So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Ennis first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold, and they were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not one of the slaves of the high priest. A relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off said, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately, the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. 
They answered him, we do not have the right to execute anyone in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to, them, said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the people. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, then you are a king. Jesus answered, you say I am a king. For this I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? When he had said this, he again, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to re release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, the king of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. But they answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you? I have the power to crucify you. Jesus responded, you would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. Then he said, Behold your king. But they cried out, 
Take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests responded, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be, in order that the passage of scripture might be filled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the Spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of the week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. 
But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage that says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus out of fear, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new tomb, which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day. The tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Just a few weeks ago, I went shopping before the great lock lockdown, and I bought what was needed for at least a week or two to come. And I shopped and shopped and shopped and got what was necessary and my eye caught the attention of a large bag of Nestle Crunch Bars. There were hundreds of them in a big bin in the jewel. And I kept eyeing them, thinking, do I really need them? I haven't purchased a Nestle bar in years. So I decided, why not, during these difficult times, why not? I just bought one package, so I wasn't hoarding, and I brought it home with me. And there I sat with this big bundle of Nestle Crunch Bars. I took one out, and I sat in the chair, and I started to eat it. And I took out a magazine. America, it's a great magazine published by the Jesuits. It's one of the best Catholic magazines ever. I took out America magazine, and I had the Hershey bar right there, and this is the honest to God truth. There was an article in America magazine as I was eating my Nestle bar written by a writer who had given up chocolate for Lent, and she decided to look into the reality of chocolate and learn some really disturbing things about the production of chocolate. So I began to read this article. There's my Hershey bar on my chair, and the bundle of Hershey bars is sitting near the stove, and there I sat reading the realities of how this chocolate bar came into my being. And as her article relate, she learned of the unjust practices, how people were being used in the growth, the harvesting, the production, the distribution of chocolate in its many forms through many companies, Nestle being one of them. And what caught my attention was the children, how many children were used and are used in the production 
of chocolate for all of us, for most of us, perhaps, who love to eat chocolate. So there I was, a huge touch of irony with this article, America Magazine, my little bar of chocolate, the big bundle over there in the kitchen, and there I was reading about the injustice of making chocolate. That article brought to light a hidden darkness that I had never even thought about or heard about. I heard about many others, but not particularly this one, about the chocolate that I so love and how it gets into the store and how I can purchase it and enjoy it. The children, 10 years of age, being used, child labor, many are even being trafficked. So a light was shown upon this reality called chocolate. It pierced my own conscience. It made me wonder, and it made me pray over all the hidden darknesses that we don't see. Just like I was so unaware of chocolate and what is involved in its production, all the hidden darknesses of the world are brought to light on this Good Friday. It's called Good because anytime light shines in the darkness and reveals injustice and violence and hatred, it's a good reality because we can change and we have the power to change as followers of Jesus who looked on the cross, who accepted the reality of the cross. John makes it clear he knew what was going on. He freely embraced his destiny. He freely went on that cross. He reminded Pilate that power <laughs> comes with a price. And even Pilate's power was conditional and temporary. It wouldn't last. And Jesus stood silently because he wanted to embrace the one reality that would make the world good and holy and blessed. The cross sheds light on the hidden darknesses of this world in which we live, but that light must shine first in every human heart. We must realize and sense the hidden darknesses and the sins in our own hearts, how we harbor bitterness, how we harbor prejudice, how we harbor envy and jealousy. The darknesses all begin in each of the human hearts and they're expressed in external realities of injustice, in unjust structures of politics and economy. This is the day, Good Friday, that we say the cross is planted firmly in the field of the world. It's planted firmly in all the darknesses. And Jesus, through his sacrifice, giving up his body, giving it up for us, gives us the power to face the darkness in the light of the cross. The cross gives us the power to change things. The cross gives us the power to open our eyes and to see how children, children are abused. The power of the cross empowers us to live out a power of service and love and self-sacrifice. That is the cross. That is Good Friday. And as Jesus embraced his cross, we must all embrace the many crosses that are planted in our lives, from illnesses to family problems, to suffering, to loneliness, to this disease that is infiltrating our world, causing so much isolation, especially among the poor and those in hospitals and nursing homes. Good Friday, the cross is the power to change things. The cross gives us the power rooted in the spirit of baptism to face the darkness with the power of love, to face the darknesses with solutions that must and only be nonviolent. This is Good Friday. We all are in this together. And may the light of the cross of Christ shine 
in the darknesses of our hearts, in the darknesses of the world, in the darkness of this virus, and that light is working. It's bringing us together as a people. It's knocking down barriers as we realize we're in this together. People of all different kinds of religions, no religion, faith, no faith, we're all loved by God. We're created in the image and the likeness of God. Let us face the hidden darknesses that want to separate us. Let us face the hidden darknesses so that we can enjoy life. We can enjoy humanity. We can be at peace with each other and even enjoy a bar of chocolate. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over all the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for our, our Bishop Blaise, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who made your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of the catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated 
may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you, come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of all the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of all peoples, Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurances of peace, the freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. And let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all of its errors and all the many darknesses, that he may banish this virus and all disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, protect our children, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to all the sick, protection and guidance to all of our first responders and to all those of salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need Your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord.
the Savior's command and form a divine teaching we dare to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, so we pray, from all that is evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, safe from all anxiety as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, and the, power, the power, and the glory are yours, now, now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy you should enter into my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Bow, ya, bow down your heads and ask for blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord.